So I'm in the PDF notes number nine now, which is very recently revised. Uh, I hope you've got it. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's not just revised, it's recently posted, uh, period. And we're on the uh, old page number 234, which is sitting there at the upper right. And the topic for notes nine is PSDM. Uh, and PSDM pre-stack depth migration via Kirchhoff uh, summation. Still uh, just adding together those uh, smiles, those ellipsoids of revolution with the foci in, in uh, cost of velocity, anyway, the foci at the uh, source and receiver, wherever the source and receiver happen to be, even if they're buried. And the big departure here, and the whole reason that it's pre-stack depth migration and not PSTM, PS, pre-stack time migration, the whole reason is that uh, we are allowing velocity to vary in any way at all on our 2D section. So um, because I don't have access to a really good, or I haven't implemented um, somebody else's really good 3D travel time forward calculation, okay, a deterministic uh, 3D travel time calculator. I can I can only do this kind of PSDM currently uh, in two dimensions, and so all the codes that uh, that that I've given you and that I'm working on um, are dealing with a two dimensional Earth. <clears throat> But we can allow velocity to vary uh, laterally, not just smoothly, but in any way that we can actually accomplish that travel time calculation. Later on, when I do talk about um, deterministic travel times by uh, finite differencing the iconal equation in the manner of Vidali, I will um, uh, I will cover. Um, what kind of velocity models we can um, we can get travel times for, and thus achieve uh, PSDMs for. So this um, endeavor of um, 2D um, PSDM it represents maybe half uh, a third to a half of my current work, and it's really responsible for all the success that. Um, my colleagues at Optum, Satish and, and Bill Hondras, that they've had um, in doing imaging for geothermal prospects. And I may get a chance later on in the class to show you some, um, uh, some presentations that uh, we've made where we show some of the results. But what we're going to do here in this class is we're going to talk about the, the roots of um, my work on, on PSDM with Kirchhoff and uh, some projects that uh, you know, I've kind of uh, long forgotten about but uh, are still, I think, pretty significant in uh, my development of the method. Now, what we have here on this first page is just a... Um, a small uh, synthetic example, and there's a uh, uh, there's a deepening sedimentary sequence with a p velocity of three kilometers per second, overlying a um, uh, uh, some kind of basement that's at five point five kilometers per second, and within that basement is a straight fault zone dipping to the north in this picture. Um, that inside itself, it's a low velocity fault zone and has a velocity of five kilometers per second. And if you do any kind of um, any kind of the typical uh, imaging, all the way from uh, um, stacking and and uh, NMO correction uh, through um, 
uh, post stack uh, zero offset migration through uh, even the most elaborate pre stack um, time migration that, that you have available, you'll quickly discover that uh, you know with these synthetics and given the fairly substantial dips on this substantial uh, velocity uh, contrast, right? It goes from you know you step over uh, just 100 meters and you can go from three kilometers per second to five kilometers per second laterally. All right, and what you'll find is that you cannot image that as that fault zone as in its straight form. Okay. So this is really uh, the first um, the first way I thought about this problem is uh, how do we recover you know below this complex bedrock surface this complex uh, basin bottom how do we still image the fault zone as straight okay and the uh, uh, down below is the um, the image of that it, it's a it's a simple um, you know there's some kind of simple survey taken across this synthetic uh, section and um, that was done with a full wave uh, but only acoustic uh, finite difference uh, uh, forward calculator um, and and we will probably get a chance to talk about uh, full wave acoustic and elastic finite difference modeling later on in this in the semester. Uh, depending on your interest. So um, what you see is a straight uh, fault zone. Okay. Um, and you see that the reflect the reflector, the reflection coming from that fault zone has negative uh, polarity. It's got 180 degrees uh, phase, uh, which is what you'd expect from a low velocity fault zone. Um, okay, so um, uh, that's uh, that's just a little uh, a little tickler, and let's think about uh, you know given what we um, what we talked about for PSTM. All right, what do we need to uh, to do a PSDM? Well, we're going to we're going to use the same Kirchhoff migration version of downward continuation, which, as I was talking with you guys after the lecture about yesterday, what's really happening is is it's ray continuation. If the rays are going up, then we're doing downward continuation. If the rays are are going sideways, then we're doing sideways continuation. Okay, it's whatever the ray path between the source and the receiver. Requires so um, because I gave you the <coughs> the um, because I gave you the the definition of migration as being downward continuation uh, halted by an imaging condition, and we are still basically in most of the things we're doing here. Uh, you know, not all, but in most things we're doing here, we're taking a surface survey recorded at z equals zero. And we are downward continuing the waves to um, <clears throat> to non-zero depths. Okay, um, I, I'm I'm fine with calling it downward continuation, um, but it's not uh, not strictly downward continu downward only continuation. Um, okay, so we're going to use the same downward continuation. What about the imaging condition? Okay, and as you saw for the 3D PSTM, all right. Uh, the the imaging condition was very simple. It was tracing a ray and getting and not not tracing a ray, just getting the travel time. All right. What's the minimum travel time from you know according to Fermat's principle from the source to the reflection point? And what's the minimum travel time? Under Fermat's principle, from the receiver, and then using reciprocity, projecting that as a source to the um, the, the same reflecting point. Okay, so we're we're just trying to take data taken at the receiver, and we're using that imaging condition, right, which is the data at time t s plus t g. Okay, 
and we're using that imaging condition to back project the arrival into the model space, okay, from the data space into the model space. In this class, I'm going to be talking, you know, using this tomographic and inversion type of terminology more and more. So this is a, a uh, this kind of Kirchhoff migration is actually a variety of tomography. It's a variety of, of seismic inversion. Uh, it's just one that isn't usually called um, a tomography. But I'll show you how it's essentially a tomography. That comes from the thesis work of my classmate, uh, Ronan Lebra, um, who is... Uh, uh, now working in, in uh, Vienna with the uh, uh, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. Um, all right, so we have, um, I should enlarge this to fill the screen. Um, so what we need is to be able to cast the travel time from every source point we have, and you know we've we've all too painfully uh, for for our Santa Medio data sets been trying to figure out where our source points are, um, and all of our receiver points. So every different surface point we have, we need to be able to um, find their travel times from all those service points to all of our candidate reflection points, which basically we take as every point in, in our two D section all the different combinations of X and Z that we have available. Now this is pretty easy um, if, uh, if velocity is constant, right? It's just a very simple, um, uh, very simple uh, Pythagorean, uh, Pythagorean theorem. Uh, even, if, um, um, even if velocity is uh, um, is a, a function of depth, and even if it's a strong function of depth, z, then uh, we can cast rays at uh, constant p and integrate down to, to z uh, to, get the, uh, uh, to get the time. Uh, how do we know what, uh, what p to, uh, to use? Um, we have to try a bunch of p's, and, and actually, you know, we can't get the time deterministically. Um, we try a p, and if it if it hits the uh, uh, the reflection point we're after uh, at uh, you know the right distance, um, then uh, then we uh, uh, then we call it good. Um, but uh, usually it'll overshoot or undershoot, and we use Newton's method to uh, or or there's many fancier methods uh, like ray bending is a currently very popular one. Um, <clears throat> That's used by uh, Alistair and um, uh, and Graham, um, and uh, you know we can uh, uh, we can hone in on it. Okay, so um, you know, however we're going to get velocities, I'm sorry, however we're going to get times, uh, and and of course what we want to do, and and of course Graham and Alistair do it. Uh, with uh, laterally variable velocities, um, we have to um, we have to take every surface point, whether source or receiver, and find the times from that surface point to every point in the uh, uh, in the, in our subsurface section. Okay, so um, we gotta we gotta somehow make a travel time matrix for each source or receiver position. Okay, x whether it's s or g, and uh, you know then we have to organize our data. And the way, uh, as you've seen, that I've done that is by organizing the travel time data into travel time sections, which are you know these uh, sections where the travel time has been projected to every every point in the uh, uh, in the in the section from one source. And so we have a a, a travel time volume. Um, which, uh, uh, or a, uh, very often a folder, uh, and in there will be a file that's labeled with the uh, 
uh, the station number of the source point on the surface, and uh, that file contains this travel time section. And then the folder or the volume contains all of the travel time sections for all of the uh, different x values that we need, all the different source and or receiver locations. OK. Uh, and and uh, what I don't say here, because uh, I wrote this originally before Vidali's paper came out on deterministic travel times and finite difference in the iconal equation, um, that uh, you know Vidali was the innovator who provided the solution. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, uh, as we know, his his original code from 1988 is uh, not that great. It uh, does break down, uh, especially if the uh, lateral contrasts are too sharp or if there's uh, too much backtracking to try to follow the uh, uh, you know, travel times that are, that are, that are, and waves that are coming back toward the, uh, the source. Okay. Um, very troublesome. And uh, maybe some of you are, are working on, uh, on some ways of improving that. Um, but um, uh, the truth of the matter is is that nobody, everybody was using these, uh, you know, ray tracing methods, where you get more information um, than you need for uh, for this imaging condition for migration for PSDM. You know, when you trade when you follow this uh, this ray down, you know, even in in v as a function of z only, okay, you know the whole path. We don't need to know the whole path. We just need to know the travel time. We don't care about the, the path really at all. Okay, you know maybe if we're doing AVO work, we're going to care about the angle, right? The angle of incidence at our reflection point here. Um, uh, that is as much of the path as we need to know. Okay, uh, we really don't need any uh, any of the rest of it. So um, Vidali's, um, Vidali's routine does not get you paths. I mean, there are attempts, and, and uh, it's possible to get paths out of it. OK? Um, uh, it, um, uh, it just gets you travel times. And that's all we need OK? for uh, for PSDM, and it gets them very efficiently. It doesn't iterate. Okay, it has to execute one square root per sample per pixel in the two D model. Okay, all right. When it backtracks, yeah, it has to execute more, but basically, it just scales linearly with the number of of uh, of Pixels in the in the model, the number of velocity cells in the model. Um, absolutely brilliant. Um, certainly, Vinali was the first one to publish it. Uh, there have been lots of improvements published, um, uh, and uh, there's lots of proprietary software out there. Some of which you've heard about that uh, does a better job, um, but no one can do it faster. Okay, you know Vidali's idea took it. To, he, he basically cut the um, the number of computations needed for PSDM by two orders of magnitude. Okay, and and when you consider you know the extension of Vidali's methods to three dimensions, that just makes it possible. Okay, so we can have very fine, very well sampled models. And um, and we can have three D models, and the computation time is um, is minimal. Okay. It um, the way the way my codes work is uh, we pre compute. We we of course there's all the work that goes into estimating the velocity model. Can't get around that. All right, and you guys have been involved in some of that. 
Okay, and you know how that how that goes. And that's you know that's the real work that is necessary for PS um, PSDM. Okay, then uh, it's it's really just a little bit of summation that's required to um, um, to get the uh, uh, to get the PSDM. So the work is where it properly needs to be. Um, you know, PSDM is nothing big. It's nothing that you know every processor should should uh, they should offer a you know PSDM capable migrations, and they should they should throw those in for free if you pay them to do the hard work of, of finding the laterally variable velocity. Okay. Too many processors are pricing their uh, their processing based on which algorithm that uh, that they give you. You know, they probably charge twice as much for PSDM as for a PSTM algorithm. But so they charge you twice as much, but they don't do any better job getting the velocity model. So it's not worth paying for. Uh, and that's one of the points that I made in um, our uh, Satish in my class uh, at the last um, at the last uh, uh, National Geothermal uh, uh, Academy last June on uh, seismic uh, profiling for uh, for geothermal exploration and development. All right, so my favorite way of uh, of illustrating this uh, is not like Clairbout's. Um, you know, Clairbout would pull out some some simple examples that would get right to the heart of the problem without distracting you with. Uh, with all the uh, all the data problems, I'm I'm much more oriented towards uh, looking at case histories. And here we are on the northwestern side of the Mojave Desert, uh, straight north of Los Angeles, uh, about 200 kilometers, I think. Um, about a quarter of the way between, uh, if you're driving from LA up 395 to um, uh, to Reno, about a quarter of the way along, and um, there's this uh, um, Cocorp line. Okay, so this is a deep crustal seismic reflection line for ganged vibrators, um, ten kilometer long spread, pushing it off end across the landscape. Um, the Cocorp consortium, so-called consortium funded by NSF uh, and run out of Cornell. They did um, probably 100,000 miles of such profiles um, across the US in the, um, in the 80s. Um, and it resulted in some master's theses uh, for um, Cornell graduate students. And, and it resulted in, in some um, um, uh, in some great papers, uh, doing very very simple seismic work, you know, and showing for the first time what's going on in the continental deep crust. Great papers, uh, you know, extremely well cited, um, but mostly by uh, uh, Cornell lead authors. Um, and uh, our our seismological community. Uh, uh, looked at that experience and the funding that NSF had given them, and they said, "Well, we're never going to let NSF give that much money to the uh, um, active source seismologists again." And they basically, after the the, you know, what I would call great success of the Cocorp project, um, and maybe with a little agitation from uh, people like me, um, they've never, uh, uh, which I now regret. They never um, funded, uh, um, you know, they've consistently defunded active source seismology in the US. So the Germans, the Japanese, the Spanish, um, the, uh, the still uh, strong British uh, um, uh, United Kingdom of uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, um, uh, the Australians, uh, the New Zealanders, uh, they continue to have uh, government-funded uh, seismic reflection programs um, 
they continue to do uh, many uh, uh, many reflection profiles, uh, vibrator profiles, uh, offshore profiles. Um, uh, most years, in the U.S., we do about ten percent of that much work. All reflection profiling uh, in the U.S. is done commercially, um, or maybe sponsored by DOE uh, in their geothermal program. Um, so um, this, uh, these CoCorp uh, profiles are really a treasure trove of data. Um, you can even pull out some uh, some things about uh, you know they're they're really tuned to get uh, uh, look for reflectivity and near horizontal reflectivity as you might imagine at 20 kilometers depth. You know they only have a 10 kilometer long spread. Uh, but you can see faults, uh, uh, steep faults near the surface. Um, you can even see some of the larger basins and characterize some of the larger basins that the Cocor profiles uh, cross over. Uh, they're all over the United States, and you can get the data for free. So, um, uh, and I, I imagine that each of the places that you guys worked over the last uh, uh, the last summer. You know they have a, a small library of uh, of the cohort data, which uh, uh, they might look at uh, if they're going into an entirely new basin, because that might be the only profile that exists. Okay, so um, here in the Mojave, um, there were a number of lines, uh, more than I'm showing here. This is called line three. And what we're going to be concerned with here today is called line five, which after some bends um, through the uh, non-existent California city, goes north and crosses the Garlock Fault. The Garlock Fault, just to remind you, is one of these northeast striking um, left lateral uh, strike slip faults that is, um, uh, appears periodically in what you might call the eastern California shear zone. Or the um, um, uh, or the Walker Lane, uh, all the way up to uh, you know we have the Olinghouse Fault, again left lateral, northeast striking, uh, that comes into East Sparks, um, and uh, runs right behind the uh, the Apple Data Center uh, that they're building uh, out uh, um, out between here and Fernley. Um, so, uh, uh, and these are active faults. They're, they're capable and may have produced earthquakes. We're, we're not sure um, of, um, you know, magnitude 7.5. Um, if the entire Garlock broke, uh, that would be, um, that would be uh, um, a 7.5 earthquake probably. Uh, you can see that there's some intersection between the, uh, uh, this uh, between the Garlock Fault, it sort of projects out east towards Death Valley and, and the Mojave, and then the Sierra Nevada Frontal Fault Zone um, runs, uh, you know, basically south <clears throat> until it hits the Garlock here at um, uh, a place I call uh, well, it's actually called Fremont Valley uh, in this area, Cantil Valley over here, and. Um, uh, the Garlock Fault also takes a left step. You, uh, you come up the Garlock Fault from its intersection with the San Andreas uh, at the Grapevine on I-5, and you, um, you follow it along, and it kind of disappears along the southeast side of Cantil Valley. There's uh, scarps that are marked on the map, and... Um, can uh, zoom in a little bit. So, um, and, and then if you step left, you can start to see scarps appearing, um, you know, maybe here, maybe here. Uh, again, left lateral strike slip faulting, uh, and that <coughs> becomes the main strand and uh, continues out to the east, and it's been, you know, very well characterized by uh, my uh, colleague McGill at uh, 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 
uh, California State University San Bernardino. So this uh, cocorp line five came up into this uh, into this left step. Didn't quite ended about three hundred meters from the nearest scarp. Um, you know, looking uh, uh, of the east branch of the Garlock Fault. Okay, looking at it very closely. At, with the resources we had at the time. You can see there's got to be some complication with the Sierra Nevada Frontal Fault. Um, you know, you can imagine the Sierra Nevada Frontal Fault running in, in uh, different, uh, different ways and in different strands all the way from uh, Virginia Lake uh, here in Reno. Um, you know, that's kind of the north end of it. Uh, or maybe the north end is really, uh, really up uh, by uh, uh, Herlong at um, um, at Honey Lake, uh, back inside California, so it comes up from our part of the world, and this is its south end. Okay, so we're on the other end of the Sierra Nevada Frontal Fault. Now, if you look at the um, there's a California gravity map, which is just incredible, uh, all done, you know, many decades ago. All measured many decades ago, and um, it defines every important gravity anomaly, um, and then nicely hand contoured, you know, to to get around the problems of uneven spacing um, and uneven coverage of gravity measurements. Uh, very effective. Um, every map is interpreted, and you can there's uh, like thirty or so two degree sheets that cover all of California. Uh, you can get them from the California Geologic Survey. Um, really, been no need to update that. It's just a fundamental database that uh, you know we all use since. So you look at uh, at the California gravity map, or the California gravity atlas. Excuse me. I think we have a copy here in the De La Mer Library, uh, and you see that uh, this left step in a left lateral fault is associated with a uh, <clears throat> with a, let's see. That's uh, I think ten. Yeah, about a uh, 30 or 40 milligal low in um, in Bouguer gravity. So there's a basin in there. Why is there a basin? Well, a left lateral fault, left step, and it's an opening. It's an opening step. It's an opening. It's a releasing bend, an opening step for a left lateral fault. On a right lateral fault, you know, a left step would be a constraining bend. <clears throat> uh, and you can see the the topography here. It's uh, you know, this white is a the white area is a local uh, elevation low, okay, by uh, about a thousand feet, and then uh, I think every every changing color is another thousand feet up. Um, and there are uh, <coughs> there are some uh, wells in here, and the the ones that are filled in with black um, intersected bedrock at um, at the the meters depth that's given. And the ones that are not, uh, they're not filled in. Uh, they didn't intersect bedrock, but they tell you that you know this number of meters for that one, 100 meters. Uh, that's the uh, <clears throat> that's thus the minimum depth that um, uh, that bedrock that uh, um, that it would be to bedrock. And um, so, for instance, we have uh, 1,450 meters uh, bedrock intersection. Right there, close to the line. Okay, and uh, you know, given the gravity information, uh, probably much less, uh, just uh, a few hundred meters of, of bedrock depth along line five uh, south. Another uh, quaternary scarp over there, kind of projecting um, projecting north northwest of the Helendale and the Mirage Valley and the Lockhart. Um, and a bit further to the southeast, these are all faults that broke right lateral in the Landers earthquake. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's back out a little bit for a little more gener general general uh, view. Okay. So here we have a uh, uh, a view of the. Uh, of the entire what I call Mojave Wedge, and here's the Sierra Nevada Range Front Fault, 
Here's that left lateral Garlock fault. Okay, and this is a view from um, uh, one of my tectonics colleagues. Uh, what is his name? Sorry. Um, at least I reference it in the paper. This is from my 1991 paper. San Andreas Fault in its big bend here. Uh, salt and troughs down here. Um, and you have the transverse range mountains that um, are uh, kind of weirdly uh, east-west oriented. And then these right lateral faults. And uh, you know this is uh, my colleague's model for uh, how uh, they're moving. And nobody was sure that was correct until um, basically all of these faults. Uh, uh, these faults here broke in uh, the 1992 Landers event, magnitude 7.2 to 7.5 event. A whole series of ruptures, um, and then also the Big Bear event uh, down here. So you know all this was confirmed by uh, historic earthquakes, and uh, what what this predicted was that you know the Cantile Valley in here. There's the actual step over there. Cantile Valley is uh, a place that would be opening up, and that's why there's a basin there, and it opens up partly along this. Uh, uh, due to right lateral motion, um, just a, a little bit along the Hellendale Fault. Okay, there's. I've been through this close up. We've looked at these uh, at these depths. We're gonna we're gonna take a line of sections, you know, right across the the valley here, right up to the end of the line, um, you know, where it's uh, 300 meters uh, from the nearest uh, uh, scarps of the east branch of the Garlock Fault. And our sections are going to be 10 or 15 kilometers long. <clears throat> and this is a, uh, I found a bunch of illustrations uh, that I cooked up and hadn't shown in many years um, for, this, uh, for this lecture. Um, I made this using a, um, a 3D visualization facility that, um, um, that I learned how to use in uh, between 1988 and uh, 1992. Um, so you could put in um, uh, voxel cubes, uh, uh, hundreds, maybe even a thousand uh, uh, voxels in um, in any uh, in any of the three dimensions, and then visualize them. As uh, you can see, this is a, a kind of a volume translucency uh, application. And <clears throat> I'm still uh, <clears throat> uh, this this kind of facility at the time cost about hundred thousand dollars, and I'm still waiting for um, um, to get all of the facilities I had back in 1990. I'm still waiting to get all those capabilities back in in things like Open Detect. I mean, what can I expect? Open Detect is free, right? So that's a that's a huge ratio of uh, of cost. Uh, that the that this, this software has come down. <clears throat> so what was I trying to get at here? Um, you know the the origin and nature of the Mojave Wedge and and of the Garlock itself has always been rather mysterious. <clears throat> so we have the Garlock Fault here. There's that east branch going off towards us. The southwest branch going off towards the San Andreas Fault into the screen, and. Um, and we're in we're in that that area that's uh, <clears throat> right um, um, right where the line comes through. The line comes up here. Here's a <clears throat> proposed uh, uh, strand of the Hellendale Fault, and it's doing a little bit of vertical offset of the uh, um, of the bottom of the basin, um, and uh, and maybe a deeper. Uh, uh, deeper, a bit deeper uh, uh, interface. Uh, probably th that would be the uh, the top of the ran schist. Uh, so you'd have um, you'd have uh, uh, in the basement <clears throat> you'd have Sierra and granite, okay, which extends you know way far east uh, of the Sierra itself, um, especially in the Mojave, and then uh, um, uh, you'd go through the ran thrust. Which actually crops out of the mountains uh, uh, to the southeast, and uh, and then below the Rand Thrust, you know, maybe all the way to the Moho, 
you'd have this uh, Rand schist subduction complex, kind of like uh, the the fabled gray wacky in in New Zealand uh, rocks that uh, or the uh, Franciscan in uh, in in Western California, you know rocks that that you know have been involved in subduction, but you can't tell anything else about them because they're so scrambled up. So uh, you have a little bit of right lateral motion, uh, and that opens up this uh, this basin, uh, and it's opening up with a with a heave. Um, you know things don't. Uh, there has to be a curved detachment fault here, and you have to have strike slip motion and a little bit of uh, of normal motion uh, along this uh, along this detachment fault. So that's one one proposal for how you get all these shifting and 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 little sub microplates rotating around vertical axes in the Mojave, you have it all bounded by a detachment at the bottom. So my task was to use the data that was recorded right across here and try to track this, uh, this east branch of the Garlock Fault from the surface where there were scarps, you know, right up here, and then down and see its true geometry. You know, is that surface uh, is is that Garlock Fault? Um, is it uh, does it have a southward dip, or is it? You know, most strike slip faults are supposed to be ninety degree dipping. They're supposed to be vertical. So does it have a southward dip? And then can we connect it to any structures? Can we do we have a chance of seeing uh, this uh, uh, this curving of the detachment? Okay, and the shape of the basin. That was the. Uh, uh, the task that I that I set for myself and and my uh, my student um, um, Chin he worked on it uh, as well. So here's um, uh, what we were faced with, you know. And there's just no way out of the um, of the need for uh, uh, pre stack depth migration here. You know, we have uh, fast Sierran uh, uh, bedrock. Sierra and granites. We have a relatively slow basin, so you just you go laterally 100 meters across the basin boundary, and it's a factor of two uh, velocity increase at least. Okay, so I don't show in this diagram. I don't show the ray bending, you know, refracting through here as it should, but it has to be. And there's you know so from this source here. You know, as the vibrator leads the uh, the liner receivers north, and it stops about right here. Okay, not quite to the the uh, outcrop of the east branch. All right, it's going to send uh, energy that goes straight down. It's going to bounce off the east branch, and then refract through the uh, uh, the southwest branch and that interface before hitting the receivers out here to the south. Okay, so. Um, you know, no question that PSTM is not at all going to work here, and we're also going to see these back reflections that uh, you know, they're actually propagating back towards the source, um, and and propagating a little bit north. Okay, so here's uh, a couple of uh, of shot gathers from the CoCorp line. Um, we're looking at a 10-kilometer line of receivers. Okay. North is on the left of each one. Um, I'm sorry. North is on the right of each one. South is on the left. Okay. The vibrator is uh, 400 meters off the the north end of this one. 400 meters off the north end of this one. Okay. I think this is the very final record. Uh, they just you know they didn't build up full or anything. They just stopped recording. Um, it was a contract crew that did this and. Um, I think it was a little much for the Cornell PIs to uh, bird dog them uh, extensively, um, you know, from New York to California. Um, one of the thing, one of the problems with the CoCorp so-called consortium was that they really didn't engage anyone in California. You know, there were lots of scientists in California at the time who would have loved to have uh, gotten involved in this survey, but. Uh, you know, Cornell kept all the money for themselves, um, so that was uh, one of the problems. So you have uh, a refraction coming through the basin. Could even you could th even think of it as a as a um, as a uh, um, 
um, uh, uh, as a direct wave, okay, and then you heat you hit the uh, the southwest branch, okay, and you can see the uh, the diffraction there. I think pretty clearly, maybe even a little bit of it down here, okay. So there's the diffraction back towards the source from the southwest branch, right? The southwest branch, as a reflector, as a steep reflector, is right at the surface. So you know your uh, your diffraction hyperbola should meet the uh, should meet the uh, <coughs> um, the first arrival, and then uh, notice how it heals over and and gets uh, very. Uh, um, very much uh, uh, um, higher velocity, okay. Um, and we put the vibrators a little bit closer to the uh, more in the middle of the basin uh, on the left here, and um, we have uh, um, the uh, uh, the same diffraction, okay. Uh, you can see it there near the surface. Here it's from. Uh, um, it's from a little bit deeper, you know, probably a, a corner where uh, the bottom of the basin to the south uh, hits the uh, the southwest branch of the Garlock Fault, you know, almost vertically dipping. Uh, surface multiples, uh, and I'm remembering that this dashed line here that you probably can't see in the video, um, that's where I that was my mute limit, so I muted. Uh, Everything uh, that was um, uh, above that line, because I, you know, one thing that uh, is hard to account for with Kirchhoff migration is uh, multiples, right? It doesn't allow for any multiples, and uh, although they're going to be in here, um, and also first arrivals, um, you know, are, are kind of too powerful. They kind of overwhelm the. Um, uh, the first arrivals will kind of overwhelm the uh, um, <clears throat> um, um, they'll they'll overwhelm the the reflections. So you can see I'm using these you know fairly dim um, back uh, uh, back diffractions. Okay, so so this uh, this display here. Is really giving the final result, but I have it here because uh, I wanted to um, I wanted to show you the velocity model. This was I did this project back in the days before um, Satish uh, developed his uh, velocity optimization, um, and uh, uh, so uh, you know I didn't have that available. I had to construct a velocity model in the usual way, um, you know, by uh, modeling. And I did full wave modeling to uh, try to construct this. I'll show you that in a bit. Um, and then what I did is uh, is after figuring out how to do the uh, PSDM, I then um, put the uh, um, put the PSDM result the, that image right on top of the velocity model. Uh, just scaled them and added them together. So you can see the low velocity basin and two layers in that. Probably the layers are too sharp. You can see the uh, the sediments uh, a few um, um, maybe almost a almost a kilometer deep. Um, no, that's that's uh, these are sediments at the very top. Uh, you know, quaternary alluvium, and that's uh, you know basement still, probably Sierra and granite, but not that high of velocity. And then going down into the ranch schist. Um, bit higher velocity uh, over here uh, under the uh, on the north side of the basin. You know, a little bit different. Uh, in, uh, uh, there's a reflector here that uh, that I used that did connect to the in, in line three back to the uh, uh, back to the ram thrust, but no such uh, information existed over here. So I think this is probably the local. Um, that, that, that increase in velocity with depth here is probably the local earthquake location model from the Caltech Seismolab. Um, you know, so the velocity information is not very good, but I'm trying to put in these steep boundaries. 
and uh, I forget why I, uh, you know, I, I modulated this boundary a bit. Didn't make it terribly sharp. It's sharp enough. And so here's that uh, those back those uh, uh, you know the back reflections are not imaged very well in this in this one, but the uh, the east branch of the Garlock is uh, is there strongly, and you can see that I managed to put it right on the uh, velocity interface. Okay, so in the the modern parlance, uh, you know where you're doing a reverse time migration, um, if I look at these. Uh, uh, if I looked, for instance, at the common image gathers here, I should not have cycle skips in trying to match the synthetics. Okay, it looks like I got it close enough. So probably, yeah, probably, uh, you know, this is where you, this is the degree of detail you have to start with with a modern reverse time migration. Okay, let's start taking a look at the synthetics, and uh, uh, gotta quit in a minute or so. Um, so here's a, a, a 3D, you know, semi-transparent view of the uh, synthetics, um, and I didn't put the stacking chart on top of here, but it's basically the same idea as I presented before. Um, this, uh, the face on the the front face on the right, that's a shot gather, and the face on the left, that's a zero offset section. Okay. And so, you know, as you know, the midpoint, uh, you know, a midpoint gather would be achieved by slicing in some oblique direction like that. Maybe almost the direction that I'm that I'm looking at here. Um, so, uh, uh, how did I prepare this? I made the uh, positive, and this is just a synthetic, mind you. I made the the strong positive amplitudes. Um, uh, uh, opaque, um, and the uh, you know as the positive amplitudes get go, go towards zero and get less strong, they become more transparent, translucent, and then uh, zero amplitudes and negative all negative amplitudes are transparent. Okay, just a little bit of this uh, uh, of this haziness. All right, so. Um, uh, we'll come back tomorrow at 10, and uh, uh, let's try to connect things. You know, it was a very powerful tool here, connecting things from the, um, from the zero offset section, which I could understand, you know, what structure was what, in through to the shot gathers and the common midpoint gathers. So we'll uh, come on in. We'll uh, go through that uh, tomorrow.